Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining and welcome to our next On Frequency webinar. This one is focused on custom user content within ForeFlight. This is a pretty broad topic and uh, a set of features that have been around for a long time and have expanded quite a bit in the last several years, starting from just a basic user waypoints capability and adding features like custom map layers, custom raster charts that you can display within ForeFlight, and a couple of years ago, adding the content pack feature, which allows you to bundle together many different types of custom content so that you can easily import all of them into the app and share them with other pilots. So this set of features is fairly uh, complex. And uh, I mean, its whole purpose is to allow you to import content that isn't readily available within ForeFlight. So if you have specialized content that you would like to use with ForeFlight, this empowers you to do that. But as a result, there's also a, a, a good deal of work that will be required on your end in order to bring in this content and make it work. And so that's what this webinar is about. It's about showing you uh, the steps that you need to take to create and import your own custom content and giving you the tools to do that. So our presenters today will be Joey Arena. He is a customer success team there we go, customer success coordinator, and he's a specialist uh, in terms of user content. And so he's uh, fielding lots of incoming support requests from customers about helping them with, with their custom content and uh, getting them all set up. So he is an expert on this. And also we'll have Grant Gibbons, and he is uh, one of our pilot support team members and also a specialist in terms of custom user content. He uh, uses much of this content in his own flying. And so, he has uh, seen it develop and, and knows the ins and outs of it as well as anyone. So there we go, back to that slide. Uh, before we begin, just a few uh, quick items. You can ask questions via the GoToWebinar message panel. You just click that uh, button with the question mark on it on the right-hand side of your screen, and you can type questions in and submit them to us, and our staff members will respond. We'll be responding to as many questions as we can by text during the presentation, and we'll also be responding to some out loud, um, uh, both, so we'll respond to you both by text and also uh, pick out some of the better questions to answer out loud. And we will have a dedicated Q&A section at the very end where we'll be uh, answering a lot of those. If you're having any audio problems, this, this has been something that we've been experiencing with some recent webinars where we see people complaining that they're not able to get sound or they're having video problems. If you're having those problems, you probably can't hear me right now, but if you can hear me and you eventually run into them, we recommend either refreshing your browser or maybe leaving and rejoining the webinar. And we also recommend that you don't try to join these webinars from a mobile device like an iPad or an iPhone. We've noticed in some cases that that seems to be more of a problem than if you're joining from a, a computer with an up-to-date browser. So we definitely recommend using a computer to watch these webinars if, if you have one available. The session is being recorded and it'll be accessible starting sometime uh, later today or tomorrow at foreflight.com slash on frequency. And that's where you can view all of our other recorded on frequency webinars. So with all that out of the way, I'll hand it over to Joey to kick us off. Thank you, Sam. Welcome everybody to our custom content webinar today. And uh, thank you to my co-presenter, Grant Gibbons, for his time to help share our enthusiasm towards this feature in ForeFlight. This is a very powerful feature and it is, as Sam was saying, very complex. And uh, we're happy to present this data to you. Uh, I am a customer success coordinator here at ForeFlight and my job is basically continuing education and concierge customer support for a lot of our group accounts and uh, you know specialized content such as user content and the logbook feature and uh, uh, I'm joined by Greg Gibbons and if he would like to say a little bit about himself thanks Joey hi everyone Greg Gibbons uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon uh, I've been flying professionally for about 15 years now as a helicopter pilot. And uh, over the years, I've had a need to bring in my own custom content and 
all the four flights uh, features have been great to facilitate that. And I am looking forward to sharing that with you this afternoon. Thank you, Grant. All right, everybody. So let's dig in and get started. So talking about custom content in four flight, uh, this is a very powerful tool that is used to display any form of data that's not currently available in ForeFlight that's provided and basically put together by the user yourself. The limits are only going to be your imagination and the file size for the amount of data you're going to put into it. Custom content, as Sam was saying earlier, does require a large amount of user involvement. So that happens both in the design and in the implementation of these data sets. Because it's not provided by ForeFlight, the user has to locate the data, determine whether it works for them, how to present it in ForeFlight, and then how to get it into ForeFlight, present it, and then actually utilize the data. So that seems awful complicated when you break it down like that, but once you have a working knowledge of content packs, they become much simpler to use, much simpler to create, and ForeFlight has already developed sample content packs that we'll discuss later on, where you can actually go download these sample content packs see how they're set up on the file structure, import them to your devices, and then be able to you know, mess around with it, see what works, see what doesn't. And this user data is not going to corrupt for flight in any way, so it can be a bunch of trial and error. You can continue to import your own data and see what works and get it all working together till you get your final production value. The two most common forms of custom content go in the actual charts and then the overlays. And then the overlays can include both shapes, lines, and user waypoints. So that's what we're seeing here on the screen right now is we have an area map of Southern California overlaid on the left side. And then on the right side, we're actually seeing a pipeline overlay over our four flight base map. So this was user content that was created and displayed in the app. So who uses custom content? Well, a lot of professional services that already use ForeFlight have adapted their custom content to be displayed in their own map. Many companies that do LIDAR work and aerial survey work, agriculture surveys and crop dusters, pipeline and power line inspection, these are a lot of users that currently utilize this data every day in their operations. Now, custom content can be for anybody. If you have just a bunch of friends and you wanna go fly around and look at certain points, you can create those custom waypoints. We're gonna go review that here later in the presentation. And then you can have those in ForeFlight. You navigate out to those and be able to say, all right, well, this is the area where this landmark should be for us to be able to fly over and you know so any pilot on any subscription level can create this custom content and display it in the ForeFlight mobile app so what are some tools that you can use to create custom content well the most popular is google earth and then for a lot of the more advanced features, such as adding what we call georeferencing, which is the ability for the program to know where the map is located on the Earth and then be able to present it in the moving map, or other programs like MapTiler, QGIS, and Map Publisher. But you know, Google Earth, MapTiler, and QGIS, they're free apps. Map Publisher is actually a pay-to-use app. So more people are going to end up gravitating towards Google Earth and the other programs. Uh, today's examples, I will be actually be utilizing Google Earth. So what areas do the, does the ForeFlight mobile app utilize custom content? The most popular and the most well used is obviously going to be on the maps page. The maps page is already built around a moving map that already has the ability to tie into your internal GPS or an external GPS 
to provide your active position while you're flying. Now we can add the, that custom content such as waypoints or a path, a flight path. We can do those. We can uh, enter in waypoints. We can have a waypoint that actually has a PDF file attached to it. So if you were flying to an offshore rig and you wanted to have uh, data about the actual helipad that was located there, that's a very common use is you could actually have that PDF there. Or like with our sample content packs, we have the Wikipedia pages for many Texas landmarks. So when you click on one, say the Alamo, there is an associated Wikipedia page that's available in the app when you tap on it. And then with a more advanced feature in the content packs, we can actually place any PDF file we would like in the airport's information page. That's going to be placed in the procedures tab and we can actually customize the name of the folder and then the name of the PDF that we place there. And so if you're going, if you have a special airport that you fly to a lot and you have your own procedures for that airport or just any, if you're flying off airport to a airport that's already listed, that might be closed or just very remote, you can place your own files in the airport information and then by tapping on the map on that waypoint or in the airports page you will also be able to see those pdf files and if those pdf files are geo-referenced you can actually add them to the map the same way that you do an approach plate now the difference between user content that i will be covering and then content packs that grant will be covering are the user content is available on all subscription levels and persists of raster charts, vector overlays, and user waypoints. And I'll explain what raster and vector are very shortly. So these are the basic user content and they are individual files that are loaded and then are only able to be loaded one at a time. Whereas a content pack, even in its name, suggests that this is going to be a single file that has multiple attributes to it, so it can have subfiles. So you can have one KML layer and one chart, and then those associated PDF files with it, and be able to bring all of that information in to the program and have it all work together and mesh as one. Content packs are just that advanced little section where it's kind of a nexus that brings it all together. Both content packs and user content are available on all of our individual plans, but content packs are only available on performance level group plans, such as the military flight pack or business performance. So starting with user content, where we're actually gonna get a little more deeper into developing these uh, three different forms of user content. It's gonna be located in our new 12.4 UI now, where we now have a flex button and our new more tab feature instead of more being its own page. So you'll find custom content lo located as the fourth tab down when you tap on the more button. When you open custom content, because that's the last tab you place or you tapped on in ForeFlight, it will allow you to have that saved as the new flex button. So if you're flying and you need to access that custom content very quickly, then you are able to just tap on the flex button, go immediately to custom content, load the file that you're looking for, and be able to move on with your flight. So the three types of user content are raster maps, vector data, and user waypoints. Some of the key features are the ability to place each of these on the actual moving map. and I've already mentioned that the data is created by you, but all of this information is readily shareable, utilized from the iPad. So you can airdrop it to another iPad close to you. You can send it by email and, or you can import it directly by saving it from your computer and dropping it in while connected. And uh, the next thing we're going to be discussing is the custom charts. So a chart is basically essentially a map. So when we're talking about a raster map, raster just means like pixelation. It's not a very smooth, when you zoom in really hard, the resolution kind of gets a little breaky. 
But for in for flight, when you open the drop down menu, you'll notice that the street maps and the aerial map and the sectional maps are essentially what we call raster data. They're a large area file that contains information on it, as opposed to vector data, which is an overlay on top of another map. So when you're looking at the drop down menu here, you can see on the left hand side that this chart is called the Laguna Madre chart. It's easily accessible in the drop down menu. And on the right side of the chart, you will find the vector data, such as your weather overlays. And if you look towards the bottom, you'll see user waypoints. And then even further down from that, you'll see the custom layers that are also loaded on the file. And we'll uh, outline that just a little more shortly. Currently, MB tiles and geographic PDFs are the, the formats that we currently support. So taking a raster image, which is like a JPEG or a TIFF or even a PDF, you can take those files, add georeferencing to them, and then we can import it into the program and have it be able to be displayed. Now, where certain data breaks down is the fact of how do you project this image into ForeFlight where it actually matches up with our uh, maps inside. So that's called a map projection, and we support a couple different variations of projections, but the most common are the Lambert conformal and the Mercator projections. Uh, all of the sectionals are done in Mercator, so that's one of the most common used projections for aerial navigation because it leads to less error. So you got to think about it like this. It, the, the Earth is round, and if you take a piece of paper like a map and you place it on the Earth, it's going to have those little bubbles on it that are going to distort. So that's why using these projections are very key to getting a map to georeference and work with ForeFlight because if you were using two different projections, while the coordinates would be the same, there, one of the maps would have to distort. So we, we definitely want to make sure that you're starting with good data and you're importing good data. Uh, for the custom charts, you're going to want to use a program like MapTiler to create MB, MB tiles or use a program like QGIS, which is a free download, and it can take any raster file and convert it to a geo PDF, which are very easy to work with in ForeFlight. So at the end of this, we'll talk about some keywords to help you search uh, to go to our knowledge base articles that will actually outline how to create this kind of content and add georeferencing to it. But uh, searching map Tyler or QGIS are two real good keywords to be able to get that. Importing this data into the program is done through email with Mac users. You can do it through AirDrop. And on your iPad, you actually have another application that's called Files. And Files can hook to your iCloud account and you can have those files available both on your computer and your tab and your tablet and then tap on the file in files and say copy to ForeFlight and have those files loaded onto your device. And uh, for this particular version right here, this was a user that was going to do an aerial survey of aids to navigation throughout the South Texas region. And they converted this uh, normal navigation map and added the file in via map tiler to be able to place it on the map. I like the idea so much that I use ForeFlight and everything, so it'd be really cool to have this navigation chart when we go out in the boat. So this was something that uh, really interests me. I haven't done it yet, but it's on one of those to-do lists for me to get to one day. The next layer is what we're going to be called the map layers. And the example that's displayed here is an aerial section of the Keystone Pipeline. I know that most everybody has heard of the Keystone Pipeline. One of its termination points is in Southeast Texas, where I live, and that pipeline comes in and goes into the refineries here. And so this is just a fast representation of me overlaying the root of the actual Keystone as it makes it towards the refineries in the Port Arthur area. The map layers here are going to be what's called vector data. And vector data consists of 
geometric lines and shapes and points. So as opposed to raster data that is a pixelated, basically like an image, these are actually just going to be geometric shapes, essentially. And these layers are not charts in themselves. They need to be overlaid on top of something else. So the four flight base map is a good map to use. The sectional chart, uh, our aeronautical map layer is more of a vector chart, but it's because it's a chart on itself, we keep it on the raster side. But utilizing another map to place this data on just adds that extra amount of situational awareness and your task that you're orienting it to. So say you're doing pipeline surveying and you had the route that you would be flying on the moving map, that just, you know, takes a lot of pilot load off of you with where you're navigating to and you can spend, you know, a little less time focusing on where you're going and more on the overall site picture of doing your task while maintaining the aircraft. Um, the custom map layers like this are really easy to produce in Google Earth. And here in just a moment, I'm gonna actually walk you through that. And they can be imported the same way that the raster data can through email airdrop in the files program. And to show you how to create one of these layers, there's lots of rice fields around here and lots of crop dusters and agricultural surveys that are being done. So I'm going to show you how to basically just create a quick shape file in Google Earth. So we're going to outline this rice field and we're just gonna basically put a square around it. So we're going to use in Google Earth, the polygon tool. So when we tap on the polygon tool, we're going to name the polygon. I'm just gonna name it survey area. And you can also put a description in that will transfer that data in when it brings it in as a KML. So we're just gonna say rice field survey. Adjusting the style and color, uh, one is the pixel width. I'm gonna use three pixels and then I'm just gonna outline it here. And uh, that way it doesn't fill in the shape, it's just gonna provide an outline. And I'm gonna mark four points, which are the extensions. And now we have essentially a square around a, a rice field that we can import into four flight. Once you do this, you're gonna go up here and you're gonna right click on that layer and then save place as. And uh, here, you're just gonna make sure you place it in the folder that you want. We have KML and KMZ files. Uh, KMZ is just a zip file of multiple KMLs. So we're just gonna save this as a KML. And then we can see here that I've got the proper file and it did place it in my downloads folder. I'm gonna airdrop it to my iPad because I am using a Mac. And it's, this is a really easy and efficient way to share data between the two devices. So as I airdrop it, we can see that it shows up on my iPad and I accept it. And then as I accept it, and that went a little quick, so I'm gonna back it up one more step. So we can see that the, we have multiple options for importing in and I'm gonna choose four flight. And then when I do that, it opens four flight and asks me where I would like to place it. The custom content folder is where it's recognizing that it should go and it recognizes it that this is a KML file. So it's going to place it into the blue label custom map layers. And when I tap on that, it imports it and verifies that it was placed in. And then I can find that by tapping on the more button and then tapping on the custom content. And then when I tap on custom map layers, we can see the bottom says survey area and there's a map, a send to map button on the right hand side. So when I tap on that map button, it brings up my white square that I created. And I'm gonna add the aerial map layer and this shows that it looks very similar to it did in Google Earth. And now I've basically placed a simple shape file onto my iPad. The last portion of user data that I'll be covering is user waypoints. This is by far the most common version of custom data that we get in ForeFlight because it's the easiest to create. You can simply tap anywhere on the map while you're in ForeFlight. It'll show the location that you tapped it and you can save that as a user waypoint. You can also import waypoints via KML and CSV format. CSV is basically a spreadsheet and I'll outline that here also shortly. So for this particular example, 
I'm going to be covering uh, here in Galveston. They have a very common helicopter tour, and uh, so you can do the 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 waypoints that they basically show to all the tourists. And um, when you're doing this, like I was mentioning before, everywhere you tap on the screen will bring up your location pop-up window. And when you tap on more and then on save, then you can get another window where you can name that waypoint and put a description in. And once that user waypoint is created, you can actually use that as a navigation waypoint also and place it into the FPL editor. So if you were gonna be flying a tour operation here and you wanted to find all of the waypoints you were gonna conduct that tour on, you would just look, look on the aerial map, choose the waypoint, save it, and then just save all of your waypoints together. Then you could add each one to the route and then save it as a favorite route in ForeFlight so that you can fly it over and over and over again. So you can see here, utilizing Google Earth again, that I already have all of my waypoints saved as a KML file. And they're already saved on the left-hand side of the screen. So as you take, you create all of this for KML, you can set up where you can save all of them as one file. And what you're going to do to do that is under My Places, you're gonna right-click there and save place as, as long as all of the layers are selected together. And I'm gonna rename this one and for Galveston. And then I'm actually gonna use a KMZ file because it's using multiple KML layers, which each one of the point is essentially a KML layer. So I save that as a KMZ and I'm going to airdrop that to my iPad also. And as it's coming in, one thing you'll notice is even if you open the file in an email and you tap on the file, it's still going to go through the same process. It's still going to say, okay, we want to copy that to ForeFlight. So we select ForeFlight from the menu, and then it's gonna open ForeFlight, and it's gonna ask us, where do you wanna put it? It recognizes that this is a KML, so it's gonna place it in the custom content folder. But here, bringing in waypoints, the program's actually gonna recognize this as two possible layers. So you can bring this in as a layer itself, just like the one we just created with the white square in the rice field, or you can bring this in as user waypoints on its own. Now, if you want to save the attributes that were created in Google Earth, such as using the same pins or shapes or in any of the same formatting that you did from Google Earth, you can bring this in as a map layer, and then those points will be selected in the layers as opposed to user waypoints, and you can still add those to the FPL for navigation. Or you can add this to your group of user waypoints. So today I'm gonna to select user waypoints, and when I tap there, it's going to confirm that it comes in, and we can see them pop up on the screen, and I say okay, and now we have all of those user waypoints imported into ForeFlight. The final way to bring in user waypoints is just build them in a CSV file utilizing a spreadsheet like I, you can see here I'm using Excel. And the format for bringing them in as a CSV file is you wanna have the first column be the name of the waypoint, the second column be the description of the waypoint, and then the third and fourth column need to be your latitude and longitude. And remember, when you're adding waypoints in the Eastern Hemisphere, you do have to use a negative value for that. We use positive in the Northern Hemisphere and then negative in the Eastern Hemisphere. So make sure that you do that. When you save that file as a CSV, and then you either email it to yourself or airdrop it, you'll get the same prompt message, and it's going to recognize it as custom content. With a CSV file, it's only going to give you the option for user waypoints, and then you'll import it, verify the import, and everything's going to be okay. And you'll have your waypoints there. So I know that was a lot. So we're gonna take a little short break right here and answer maybe a question or two. Hey, Joey, great here. Thank, thank you for all of that, that was great. Um, yeah, we did have quite a few questions come over um, while you're covering all that. 
Uh, we got a question here from a customer. He's asking if um, we support cloud sharing, or he mentions that we support cloud sharing for content packs and was wondering, do we share cloud sharing for the individual user content? So if I just have uh, you know, custom KML map layer, can I import that into like Dropbox or Amazon S3 or something and have that uh, populate on my devices? I gotcha. Okay, so uh, one of the features that we offer is cloud sharing, and that's the ability to have, if you're on a group account, be able to share documents and files across all of the users under your account. With content packs, we actually have a hidden file that we can place a content pack into that folder, and it will automatically download that folder, or at least prompt the user to download it. They don't have to, but it'll show a little red bubble and then they can download that content pack and it'll automatically load. Now where the disconnect does come in is the fact that individual user content like I've been covering, such as user waypoints, custom charts, and KML overlays, those are individual files and those are not currently supported for mass cloud sharing. But where they are is in the content pack. So you can, even if it's just one layer, you can save it under the content pack profile which is basically just as a zip file as you're fixing to learn here, place that zip file in the content pack of a, drop, a Dropbox account or an Amazon S3 account. And then those will be automatically downloaded to each device on your group account. Great, Th thank you for that. Um, we had another question come in about the custom map layers, the KML files. And when this user was creating some custom map layers in Google Earth, uh, he was getting some different icons populating for flight than what he was creating in, in Google Earth. Um, and, and I took a look in, into that while uh, you were giving your presentation and just wanted to share that ForeFlight doesn't currently support all of the Google Earth icons. Um, I believe there's about maybe 15 or 20 that we do support. Now those are documented on our support page. So if you just go to foreflight.com slash support, and you search for uh, map layer or KML, uh, you can find some support articles there which specify which um, custom icons or rather Google Earth icons are supported in ForeFlight. Uh, if you can't find that, you can also shoot us an email, team at foreflight.com, and we'd be happy to share those with you. Uh, you also have the ability, if, if you can't find an icon that you wanna use in Google Earth that we support, uh, you can import your own custom icon. So, um, when you're selecting your icon down at the bottom there, there you have the option to uh, choose your own icon from your computer's file browser. You can bring in any icon. Um, it's a, a bit more technical and challenging, but if you're up for the up for the task, we're more than happy to help you get that set up. So if you run into any roadblocks, uh, again, shoot us an email, team at foreflight.com, and uh, we'll walk you through the process. Fantastic, Grant. Yeah, that's a that's a heck of an option right there. And uh, I guess we'll continue on with the process now and we will have more Q&A towards the end of the presentation. So what is a content pack? And obviously there's nobody better than to explain it than Grant himself. So we're gonna bring him back and uh, let him continue the presentation from here. All right, thanks again, Joey. Um, so both Sam and Joey have already touched on the, the basics of a content pack. Uh, it's a feature that we offer to our Basic Plus, Pro Plus, Performance Plus subscribers and our Business Performance, MFB Performance subscribers. It's a way for you to group all of your custom content into one file and then to easily distribute it to your, your pilots if you're a multi-pilot operation or amongst your friends or, or just to yourself. Um, this has been my preference for getting custom content into my uh, iPad ever since it was released. Um, there are some additional features that Joey touched on earlier that a content pack will bring you that the individual map layers won't. One of the key features is being able to associate an image or a document, um, you know, some sort of associated information with, with your custom user waypoints. Uh, let's see here. So let's go ahead and move to the next slide. And we can see here that this content pack, uh, example content pack here, has a couple custom maps, uh, some associated files. We also brought in our own plates and we've got a custom chart here. 
Now this is the this is the content pack from the more custom content page. Generally, when you're accessing your custom content, you're doing it from the maps page or the airports page. But if you ever find a need to see all of your information on one page, you can do it from custom content. You can also see here when this file was imported uh, and you can also take advantage of a, another feature that allows us to uh, kind of have like a, a version control where you can specify a version number of your content pack, which is really useful for those uh, multi-pilot organizations. And we'll, we'll explain how to, how to control that uh, a little later on in the presentation. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So at this point, we're going to play a pre-recorded video that we produced uh, back when we first released the content pack feature, which walks you through the process of creating your own content pack from scratch. So this video does a pretty good job of showing the basics of how to structure the folders and what files to put in each folder. So we're going to go ahead and just play this video through now and then continue on with the presentation afterwards and look at some of the specifics of what you can do with each file type. For this video, we'll use the sample content pack as an example. Extract the zip file and open the folder to see the pack's contents. Content packs can have up to three subfolders containing different types of custom content. None of them are required, but any that you include must use the folder names you see here to be recognized by ForeFlight. BYOP, short for Bring Your Own Plates, is for custom PDF documents that will appear in the Airport Procedures tab and in the Plates view. These can be anything from private procedure plates or airport diagrams to personal notes or photographs of the airport. Any PDF will work. Every file name must start with the airport's identifier, followed by the procedure category that it will be grouped in, like airport, arrival, or departure, followed by the name of the procedure as you want it to appear in ForeFlight. The Layers folder is for custom map layers that appear in the Layer Selector. There are two major types of layers to work with, georeference charts using the MB tiles format and vector data layers using the KML or GeoJSON formats. The easiest way to make your own MB tiles charts is to use the free program Map Tiler to georeference PDFs and export them as MB tiles. You can make your own KML files using many different programs, including Google My Maps and Google Earth, or download KML files from elsewhere. Once in ForeFlight, georeference charts appear at the bottom of the left column, while vector data layers appear at the bottom of the right column. The Nav Data folder is for waypoint files and documents, either standalone or associated with a waypoint. The waypoint files can be either KML or CSV, but only KML files allow custom waypoint styling. The document files can be either PDFs or TXT files containing plain text or HTML code, which you can easily create by changing the extension of an HTML file to TXT. To associate a document with a waypoint, the document's file name must start with the exact name of the waypoint, followed by the name of the document as it will appear in ForeFlight. You can enable NavData layers just as you would a normal KML layer, and access the linked documents by tapping on a waypoint and tapping the document name under Associated Information. These waypoints also appear in searches even if you don't have the layer selected. Finally, the manifest is an optional file containing details about a content pack, like its name, version number, and the name of the organization or person who created it. If you don't include a manifest, then ForeFlight will simply use the content pack's file name to reference it in the app. The manifest won't be necessary for most people, but if you do want to include one, just modify our sample manifest using a plain text editor, like TextEdit on macOS, and save it as manifest.json. With the pack's contents ready, compress the parent folder into a zip file. You can import content packs into ForeFlight via iTunes, email, AirDrop, Hyperlink, 
or using the Cloud Documents feature if you have a Pro Plus plan or above. To import via Cloud Documents, add a folder named Content Pack inside the folder you use to import documents to ForeFlight, and move Content Packs to that new folder to make them available for download in ForeFlight. Once a Content Pack is imported to ForeFlight, it appears in More, Custom Content. Tap on it to view its details and component files. You can tap on Document and BYOP files to view them directly, and tap the Send to Map button next to Chart and Map files to load them on the map. The contents of a pack cannot be shared or deleted individually, but you can share the pack as a whole using the Send to button in the top right and delete it using the Delete button at the bottom of the page. Now, in order to create a content pack, as we've got here demonstrated um, on the slide, we want to gather all of our custom content. So as you can see, I've got four files on the left. I've got a PDF. I've got a custom map layer, KML map layer. Um, I've also got another custom map layer. Now, this is in one of our other supported uh, file types, which is a GeoJSON. And then I've got a uh, proprietary instrument approach uh, that's in the form of a PDF. So the naming convention of each one of these files is unique, um, and they need to be named in a specific format, which we'll touch on in just a minute. And then they need to be placed in a specific folder. So the first two files in that left-hand column there, the Alamo Battle PDF and the MOA KML file, they both need to be placed into that nav data folder. Now, because both those files are in the same, are in the same folder, that's what's going to allow them with, with some additional formatting to be linked to one another. And we'll cover that a little bit more in just a minute. So we'll place our map layers and our associated information into the nav data folder. We'll place any custom charts that we have that, that don't have associated information um, tied to them into our layers folder. And then we'll place any sort of um, plate or PDF that we want to associate with an airport or a published uh, airport or heliport into the BYOP folder. So before I move on, I just want to reiterate that the three folders, the nav data folder, layers folder, and BYOP folder all need to be named uh, just as you see them there. If you only, uh, as, as that customer had asked previously, um, if he just wants to bring in one map layer, all he needs is the nav data folder. He doesn't also have to have BYOP or layers. You can have one, two, or three, or, or all of the above. So once you've got all of your custom content into the nav data layers and BYOP folders respectively, you're then going to put those three folders into one folder. That essentially at that point becomes your content pack. You name that folder or you name your content pack whatever you like. Um, so if this is for an organization, maybe you name it after your business. If this is for a fly-in that you and your friends are doing, maybe you name it July 2020 fly-in. Uh, you have complete freedom there as to what you name that content pack. Whatever you name it, that name is going to populate throughout the app. So when I go to in that hospital example I gave you earlier, when I go to that hospital and I look for that hospital plate, uh, you will see there that the name of the, the hospital that I fly for, because I named my content pack, it will, it will show up there. Uh, and we'll see that a little more uh, in just a minute. So once you move all that content into your content pack, there's, there's one more step before you can import it into ForeFlight. And that is, uh, you'll need to zip or compress, depending if you're a Mac or a Windows guy, zip or compress that file, and then you can send it to ForeFlight. So the easiest way to do that is you can email it uh, to yourself and your, your colleagues, or you could uh, airdrop it if you're a Mac user. Um, or you can also, as, as we touched on earlier, you can place that file into a, a Dropbox folder, Amazon S3 folder, and then it'll be available to be downloaded uh, to your device. So for multi-pilot operators, that cloud integration is really, really valuable. So your content pack can have custom maps, custom charts, and it can also have your own custom plate. So with 
uh, here we'll discuss um, the intricacies of bringing your own plates into the app. This feature is really made uh, available to you just by following a simple formatting or naming convention, if you will. Uh, this is specifically for PDF documents. Now it's any PDF. Um, the most common application we see is uh, organizations that have their own proprietary instrument procedures and they want to bring those into ForeFlight. The, the bring your own plates procedure has actually been around for a few years. Um, and, and we did have a customer ask earlier about um, that feature and, and how it pertains to bring uh, to content packs now. It, it's very similar. Uh, the only difference is that rather than putting all of your plates into a zipped file named the procedure zip, you'll actually put all of your custom plates into a BYOP folder, put that in your content pack, and then get it into ForeFlight. So again, the, the naming convention of your PDF is what's really important here. It's essentially made up of three sections. The first will be the airport identifier. So in this case, we have uh, Children's Hospital of Orange County. Their uh, heliport identifier is for Charlie Alpha 5. So that will be the first part of my, my procedure that I'm gonna bring into for, for flight. The next section is gonna be the name of the folder that you want it to go into. So you can actually create your own name uh, so that it creates its own folder to put this into. As you can see in the example here, I use the folder name company procedures. And when we look at it after it's been imported into the app, there's a, a folder there named company procedures with one PDF file in it. And then the last section is the actual name of the document. So however you want it to appear. In this case, uh, I imported a, a copter RNAV approach. And so I named it RNAV copter 18. Uh, however, if I would have just named it copter 18, it would appear as copter 18 uh, in the approach. And if you notice, just above uh, RNAV Copter 18, it says name of content pack here. So that home folder, the folder that we dragged and dropped our BYOP subfolder into uh, the nav data and layers folder, I named that folder name of content pack here. But if I called this, um, you know, we'll say uh, Los Angeles County uh, Fire, it would show up as Los Angeles County Fire there. And then underneath that, you would see the RNAV Copter 1A. So this is what it would look like on the maps page. Uh, you just simply tap the, the published identifier uh, as you would with any other normal published data. And then you can go to the procedure section and pull up uh, your, your plate that you brought in there. Now here's just some more examples. So um, this is similar to the air ambulance provider in the sense that we're adding an additional folder. Uh, we've already got airport departure arrival and approach folders because this is a uh, hobby, hobby airport, but we're going to add an additional folder. Uh, and I just named this one Pan Am Airlines. So you can see you're not restricted to placing your own custom plates into the pre-existing folders. but you're certainly not restricted from placing your custom plates into those folders. So in this case, uh, I've got an example of flight school and they have some specific um, ramp procedures that they need to follow. And the location of the flight school is often hard for students to find. So they created a PDF folder, or excuse me, a PDF file. They named it uh, KCNO for Chino Airport, underscore, and those underscores do have to be there. Airport, because they want this PDF file to show up under the airports tab, and then they named it location of flight school. Here's another example. Now this is that tour operator that Joey was talking about that flies out of Galveston, Texas. Uh, here we put the custom PDF into the Galveston airport under the Texas tours folder, and we named it airport operations. So when we tap on that airport operations PDF, since this is brought over with the, the BYOP or the bring your own plates feature, it's actually going to load our plates page. And as we can see, it doesn't have to be a plate. It doesn't have to be your traditional uh, you know, instrument approach procedure or anything of that nature. Uh, for this example, I went into Google Earth, snapped a screenshot, added some information about you know, uh, areas that we shouldn't fly over, where we park the aircraft, where we depart from and such. I, and then I named that PDF KGLS underscore Texas Tours underscore Airport uh, Operations. 
And that's how I brought it into the app. And this is what it looks like. So all of those PDFs that we just covered uh, were for published uh, airports or published heliports. Now, we certainly uh, will probably have some associated information that we want to tie to our custom waypoints. Now, what's unique about this is that unlike the BYOP feature that only supports PDFs because it opens in the plates view, our associated information that um, is associated with our custom user waypoints will open in the documents view. So that means we support more file types, PDF, JPEG, uh, anything that the documents view will support. It also su supports multiple pages uh, and you can have multiple files associated with each waypoint. And I'll have an example of that a little bit later. Uh, and I believe Joey mentioned it earlier as well, is that geo-referencing is enabled for this uh, also. So you could have, say for an example, you're an offshore helicopter operator and you have an offshore instrument approach. Well, you could create a user waypoint for that offshore platform. You could have your custom instrument approach, geo-reference it, associate it to that custom user waypoint and uh, send that to the map. Now, in this example, once again, our tour operator, I associated the Pleasure Pier PDF. As we can see, it opened up in the documents view as opposed to the plates view. Um, but again, really it, what you import is, is left to your imagination. I, I like the, the aerial images with the, with the text on top of it, but uh, you can really customize that however you like. So the question is, how do we create that link? How do I make it so that when I tap my tap my custom user waypoint, how do I get that associated information link so that I can tap it and it opens up in the document? Well, the key here really is, again, the, the formatting or the naming convention. Um, and then also I, I mentioned it earlier that both of those files need to be placed into the nav data folder. So I've got my custom KML map layer, which happened to be that, that tour route that we fly. So I've I had the the Galveston waypoint, then there was a pier that we flew over. Uh, I think there was an old fort there. So all of those were individual waypoints that I created in Google Earth. And then I snapped a screenshot from Google Earth and I had to name that, uh, that screenshot with a name that matched one of the waypoints that was in my KML map layer. So in this case, I had a pleasure pier waypoint. So I named this screenshot pleasure pier which was the first part. And then the second part is however I want that uh, document to appear in Fourth Flight. So what is the name of this associated information? And I just named it Tour Notes. So I named the screenshot Pleasure Pier Tour Notes, dragged and dropped it into nav data along with my KML map layer, moved it into my content pack, zipped it, uh, airdropped it over, emailed it to myself. And that's how you create that link. Now down at the bottom there, I've got a couple more examples. Um, so I have a, a waypoint named San Louis, and maybe I want that document to be named Aerial Image. There was a waypoint named Towers, um, and I made, I, there's a hypothetical landing zone there. So I have the Towers landing zone details page. Notice there's no underscores here, or any sort of uh, formatting like that. It's just really important to note that the first part of the name of that uh, associated information has to match exactly one of the names of the waypoints in your KML map layer. Now, I, I mentioned earlier that you can have multiple um, uh, multiple files associated with the waypoint. Uh, in my nav data folder here, I have a pleasure peer tour notes image, and then I have a pleasure peer approach PDF. And we can see in Fourth Flight that when I tap my pleasure peer waypoint, both of those individual files are there for me to select. Uh, if I were to tap either one of those, it would open up that file in the documents view. But because the approach PDF has geospatial information, where I went into that plane and added, uh, you know, that this point is at this Latin long and so on and so forth, uh, I can send that, that PDF to the map. So it would overlay on my moving map, just like any of your other uh, terminal procedures that are geo-referenced. Earlier, we briefly touched on being able to add a version to your content pack. So let's say that uh, you want to distribute somewhat of like a company notum to your pilots and you want to do it weekly or monthly. 
and you want to make sure that your pilots have the latest content pack up to date. The manifest is how we would recommend doing that. The manifest is just one additional file that you will add to your content pack. Uh, it's going to be of a file type that's named JSON, which uh, many of us may not be familiar with, but it's nothing more than a, a text based uh, file. As we can see, there's the example of it down at the bottom. And there's there's two uh, essentially two aspects to the, the JSON. First, you'll have uh, the name of your content pack. There's a, a colon there, and then you name the content pack whatever you like. Underneath that, you've got the version and the organization name. But rather than trying to remember um, how to create this manifest, if you go to our support page, uh, we have plenty of example content packs that have uh, pre-existing manifest there for you to, to edit to your needs. Uh, so once you get it edited with, with your content pack name and version number and organization name, you just save it uh, to your content pack there along with uh, your BYOP nav data, data folder and such. And then it, it will appear here on the content pack page as you see. So the easiest way to get a content pack to your device uh, is likely email or airdrop. Uh, however, the, the recommended way, if, if you're able to, is to import the content pack uh, via a cloud integration. So most of our pilots uh, use Dropbox. I use Dropbox and it works out really well. Uh, uh, the image on the right, you can see I have my, my personal Dropbox folder. Inside there, I created a, a folder named apps, a subfolder named ForeFlight, and then another subfolder named content pack. And all I have to do is I simply drag and drop any content pack that I create into that subfolder, that content pack subfolder, and it will appear in my download section. Uh, we have lots of information documented on our support pages on how to get this set up. Uh, but once you give this a uh, the cloud integration to try, I think you'll find that you like it because there's there's an additional advantage of importing via, via cloud integration is that you can actually remove an old content pack and replace it with, with new data by dragging and dropping your content pack into Dropbox without renaming it. And I think we'll see a little bit more on that later. Yep, sure enough. So. If you use email or airdrop to import your content packs, you can see here in this example screenshot that you can end up with multiple versions of your content pack. Uh, and, and that can become an issue because let's say that each one of those content packs has a map layer. Well, you'll then have two, three, four different, uh, or actually the duplicate map layers, if you will, that are selectable from the map dropdown list. So your pilots or you yourself will have to manually delete the old content pack and then add the new one via airdrop or email. Uh, once you get the hand of it, it's not too bad, but if you were to instead use cloud integration where you kept the content pack with the same name, but you updated your manifest version number, added or removed or edited some content, when you drag and drop it into Dropbox, Dropbox is gonna give you the option to either replace that file uh, or, or to cancel the, cancel the transfer because it has the same name. And if you select replace, it will just automatically remove the old data and add your new content pack so that you don't end up with duplicates. And here we can see an example of that. So I've got two content packs. Um, and they've got different names. You can you can import as many content packs as you like. One recommendation we have is if you have content that updates regularly. So let's say those company notams that you wanted to push all your pilots, say on a weekly or monthly basis, you could have those notams. Maybe you bring them in via BYOP or their associated information that's tied to some of your uh, custom user waypoints. You could have those in their own unique content pack that you then update regularly. Uh, and if you have some, some instrument approach procedures that don't hardly ever change, you could have those in a separate content pack. That way you're not, your pilots aren't having to re-download all of the data with each update. And lastly, uh, you can share your content packs from within the app. So when you go to more custom content, 
tap on your content pack. That share button in the top right corner allows you to share your content pack uh, via email, airdrop, or you can even integrate with other apps. So you could send that content pack to, uh, you know, maybe a cloud service or whatever apps you have installed on your on your device. Again, any questions, reach out to us, team at fourflight.com, fourflight.com slash support. All of this information is uh, documented there. Um, Google searches all also work out great. You just search for four flight content pack. Uh, you ought to get you ought to make it to our support page for content pack where all this information is uh, is available to you. Now for some questions. Thank you, Grant. That was that was great. Yeah, thank you, Grant. Um, I can go ahead and, and start teeing up some of these questions. I do want to note, though, that there is a big thunderstorm cell passing over me right now. So if you hear any loud noises, uh, that's just thunder. <laughs> so uh, first of all, how can I overlay the state lines on ForeFlight so you can see the state boundaries defined as you fly? Uh, now, I know that uh, with a lot of these questions, the answer is going to be something like, um, you know, search, you know, poke around on the internet and find something that works. It, when it comes to custom content, that is often the answer. Like if we, we can't provide a lot of this information directly, but if you're self-motivated and if you really want to get this into ForeFlight, then it's usually not hard to find stuff like this. But um, a, a general point that I'd like uh, Grant and or Joey to touch on is what are some ways that, uh, would make it easier for someone to find some of this information that they're looking for. Like we've seen questions about importing map layers of power lines. Uh, I've seen some questions, obviously this question related to state lines. Uh, so if there's a certain type of data that someone wants to import, do you have any suggestions on how they could maybe search for that? Sure, well, absolutely. <laughs> yep, go ahead, Joey. Go ahead, Grant. All right. So what we're looking for here is more than likely going to be a KML style file because we're looking to outline state boundaries or like like Sam was saying, where you're looking for power lines or pipelines or any of that other material. And of course, Mother Google is going to be where I would go to find those KML files. And those KML files can either come in as part of a content pack or as a standalone layer on its own. Uh, Grant, do you have any special areas that you like to look for KML files like that? Uh, I'd probably just focus on Google as well um, in adding KML or KMZ to any sort of search term that I'm looking for. Um, you know, social media is, media is also great for that sort of stuff. Lots of flying groups and such um, are on those social media pages and, and they share their custom content that they create. But um, in, in the example of the state lines, you know, if you can't find it, um, you can always create it. You could go to Google Earth. It, granted, it would be quite uh, time consuming, but you could go to Google Earth and um, you know, start start drawing those lines on the state line, export it as a KML, import it into ForeFlight, and then share it to all your pilot friends on social media or um, wherever you do your sharing. Yeah, that's that's a perfect answer. Um, like I said, it's really just you know go to Google and uh, use the right search terms, like Grant said, and and usually that'll get you some promising results. So uh, let's see, next one. In making a content pack for Israel VFR pilots, I found out that your database is missing two AIP published airports. Since I can't add BYOP for them because they don't exist in ForeFlight, is there a way to add them via KML and link plates to that? And we, we got a couple of other questions that were similar to this in that people were wondering how they could import data for airports that are not included in, in ForeFlight's airport database. So uh, does one of you want to address how someone could get around doing that? Sure, yeah, I, I can touch on that. Um, First, I would like to recommend you reach out to us at team at ForeFlight. There may be some reason why that um, 
data isn't in isn't in our app and it should be and uh, we would we'd love to investigate that but if for some reason uh, we're unable to bring it in as published data you could bring it in as a you could bring in those waypoints via a custom map layer um, so once again google earth add a waypoint name it uh, whatever you like and then to get any sort of terminal procedures or plates associated with it you would use that associated information link that we uh, that we would referred to you just need to be careful though um, if you're using the identifier um, you know if, if that identifier is anywhere in our database it could cause some conflict so you may want to um, you know name it something other than the identifier if you're starting to run into issues there but really where you're going to um, where you're going to want to focus your attention is going to be on uh, creating those those pdfs or, or whatever files you're creating to associate with that custom waypoint and using the associated information link. Uh, and, and as we mentioned, you can have multiple multiple files, they can be multiple page, and they can also support geo-referencing. I hope I answered the question there. Jo Joey, did you have anything to add on that? No, definitely. I, I feel that the content pack is going to be where it's going to be the strongest. And uh, doing the associated PDFs like that, you can have the georeferencing. So if you do have your own charts that you can georeference, if you did have an airport that wasn't recognized in our database, and if that's the case, like Grant said, let us know so that we can get it in there. But uh, you would be able to just tap on that waypoint on the map. It would show you the associated PDFs and the name of, say, that approach. Tap on that, add it to the map, and you'd have that overlay. Right, and there will be some limitations there. Um, for example, if you do have an approach into that airport, that approach is not gonna populate in our procedure advisor like it would for any published airport. Um, and you're also not gonna be able to access an airports page, right? Because you're not adding an airport, you're adding a waypoint to a custom map layer, but you're able to associate that, you know, the custom plate or, you know, maybe you're, you've made a taxiway diagram and you want to associate that, you could certainly do that um, with the associated information link uh, and content packs. All right, uh, moving on. I see cloud sharing for content packs. Do you plan on adding cloud sharing also for single user content? Did we already answer this one in the previous Q&A session? I believe, yeah, jo Joey did. Um, oh, Joey did. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, we don't have any news to announce today if, if that feature would be coming for the individual map layers, but hopefully we showed you how it's just a couple extra steps to bring your, your individual map layer into ForeFlight as a content pack, and then you can uh, bring it in via that cloud integration. So uh, really it's just a couple, couple subfolders compressing compressing your content pack and then bringing it in just a few extra steps so uh, hopefully it's not too much trouble and you can bring it in that way yeah so uh let's let's move ahead to some questions we haven't actually already answered uh how is procedures.zip related to custom content when should i use procedures.zip grant do you want to handle that one sure so the, the short answer is you don't use procedures.zip uh, Procedures.zip was the formatting that we used to bring in your own custom plates prior to content pack. Uh, you can still use that function. Uh, however, you'd need to be wired to a computer. So uh, for purposes of bringing in your own plates via content pack, you'll use the BYOP subfolder. So procedures.zip will no longer be a part of your workflow. Put all of your plates into the BYOP subfolder, move that subfolder into another folder that you name whatever you like it to be, compress it, and then bring bring that content pack, that zipped content pack into ForeFlight. And it's effectively the same functionality as we used to have, uh, but there's additional importing means, airdrop and email and cloud importation. Right, importing uh, BYOP as a content pack is definitely a lot easier than having to hook up your iPad to your computer and drag it uh, using iTunes. So next question, when a custom map layer is displayed, for example, a procedure, is the transparency of that changeable via ForeFlight as viewed on screen? 
So do you have the same control over the transparency the way that you do with a normal geo-referenced procedure plate in ForeFlight? Does one of you want to address uh, which types of data do support that transparency? Yeah, I can take that one. Okay, so when you have a layer overlaid on the map, uh, with the custom approaches, you get the little settings cog at the upper left-hand corner, and that's where you can bring in either bringing up another, another plate or you can do the opacity. And unfortunately, when you're bringing in an, an individual layer from the custom content, such as a chart of KML or user waypoints, those do not have the ability to adjust the opacity. But if you bring in a geo-referenced PDF through the BYOP procedures, it's added just like it was a plate coming in, just like an approach. So you can then adjust the opacity of that layer, uh, utilizing it from there. And uh, that, that is only available through the custom uh, content pack import feature. Right, so next up, uh, are underscores necessary in, uh, in the file names and folder names for custom content in a content pack? Joey, do you wanna answer that? Sure, so Grant was discussing earlier where the underscores, a lot of for flight uh, and generally f computer files in general, spaces can cause confusion in certain programs. So uh, especially in my world, in the logbook world, everything has to have underscores. So here, when you are utilizing the underscores, the underscores are in the BYOP procedures because the underscore gives the identification of where it's going to find it in our server database, such as the airport identifier, then the underscore, then the name of the folder, and then the underscore, and then the name of the file. Now, conversely, when you're doing a nav data import and you're utilizing a KML to associate a PDF file, the, underscore, the underscores aren't necessary because it's going to recognize a space as being the the separation between the name and the actual identifier. So like with a, with a user waypoint, you've got to make sure that it's named exactly the same. If you have one that's called the blue house, it has to be the space blue space house, and then whatever you wanna name it, say grandma's house, or you can have where you don't have those spaces in there and is it's gotta match perfectly so that it understands which waypoint to associate the PDF file with and then what to name it. So yes, underscores are important for BYOP and co content packs and not so important when they're uh, just utilizing the associative principles. All right, next one. Uh, does BYOP support only GeoPDF or also MB tiles? Does one of you want to answer that one? Sure. Yeah, it, it, uh, it supports both. Short answer is it supports uh, GeoPDF, MB tile, GeoJSON, KML, KMZ. I, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. This, this is just BYOP. for BYOP. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm sorry. I was thinking content back. Yeah, BYOP only supports PDF or a GeoPDF file. Or a sorry. regular PDF file, right? No, right. GeoPDF or not. Yep. Correct. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> I thought you might have misunderstood the question based on your answer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, M MB tiles is supported on the maps view, uh, but it's not supported as a, a custom procedure plate. So only PDFs are supported for BYOP, and they can either be not geo PDF, and they're you know you won't be able to view them overlaid on the map, uh, or if they are geo referenced and they're geo PDF, and and just to be clear, geo PDF isn't a different format it's the the end of the file name will still be dot pdf but geo pdf is just a shorthand for saying it's a pdf that is geo referenced so both of those are supported for byop but not other file types another question that we got quite a few times during this webinar was how do i geo reference a pdf and um, this is something that uh, grant or joey uh, mentioned earlier that you can use if you have a 
uh, you know, an image or a PDF that you want to turn into an MB tile uh, format, you can do that using uh, MapTiler. However, MapTiler will not geo-reference PDFs. And so the way that they recommend doing that is there are a number of programs that can do it, but um, the best one is uh, QGIS, which is free, free to download. And it's a very, very complicated program. However, Grant put together a really great support article that makes it very easy to follow and easy to learn how you can geo-reference these using this complicated program. So if you just go to our support center at forfly.com slash support and just search for GeoPDF or Geospatial PDF, it will be the first hit in the list. And you can look through and uh, find, it's, it's a fairly long article, but once you do this once, you can do it over and over again, and it makes it a lot easier. Trust me, I, I tried doing this uh, on my own before Grant put together this article, and I spent two days banging my head against it, couldn't figure it out. But now that this article is here, uh, anyone who is trying to create their own geospatial PDFs can definitely do it using this support article. So I strongly recommend going to our support center and looking that up because it's a really great resource. Let's see, um, next question. Okay, okay here's another one about, um, about creating one that doesn't, creating a, a custom airport. I think we already answered a number of those. How would I add supplemental information like a secondary tower frequency, which is used uh, during touch and goes on parallel runway to an existing airport? So you have various information, not necessarily a chart, but various types of textual information that you want to associate with an existing airport. What's the best way to bring in that information? Joey, do you want to answer that one? Absolutely. So you're going to utilize the BYOP procedures again, because that's where it's going to put it on the actual airport information page. Now, like Sam just said, this does not have to be a GPS approved or, or referenced document that can be laid on the map. This can be just a plain PDF that, that outlines, okay, when I'm doing you know, closed circuits on a controlled airport and they've got me on the left runway and they're bringing active traffic on the right runway, okay, they're going to put me on a secondary tower frequency so that I'm not interfering with the regular traffic. So you could have a, just an airport information page that is, you could even just call it you know, circuits or, you know, however you want to do it if your flight school has its own SOPs or an LOA with that tower operator. So you would just bring that in using the BYOP protocols. And once that's located, it would be under the procedures tab and you can place it in an existing folder or you can create your own folder and then you would be able to pull it up there. Unfortunately, we do not have the ability to edit the airport page or the airport information anywhere other than the procedures tab at this time. So you would have to utilize it under the procedures tab, but under a folder or file name of your choosing. All right, next up, uh, will content packs appear on all of my devices that have ForeFlight? So if I import them on my iPhone, will they? Will I also see it on my iPad? So basically the question is, do content packs, do content packs sync uh, between your different devices? And the answer is, I believe, and one of you please jump in if I'm wrong, I think that by themselves, they do not sync if you just airdrop them or import them via iTunes. But if you import them using cloud documents, then they will automatically be available on all of your devices. Is that the right That's answer? Right. Perfect. Yes, it is. Yeah, and, and the same is true of standalone custom content. Um, of course, standalone custom content cannot be imported via cloud documents. So if you have just a single KML file, uh, you can airdrop that or you know email it to one of your devices, but it will not automatically appear on your other devices. And you can't um, share it via cloud documents unless you bundle it into a content pack. But the nice thing about being able to email content is that as long as you can access that email from any of your devices, you can just tap on it in the email and import it to each of the devices in turn. I think we have time for just a few more here. Um,
I see one here, Sam. Go ahead. If one adds custom obstacle data as a KML, will these obstacles show up on any of the primary flight displays in ForeFlight? So the answer is unfortunately not. Uh, a KML file is going to be an overlay layer. It is going to be added on top of existing data, but is not going to succumb to other data. So uh, unfortunately, like traffic and obstacles, you can see on synthetic vision, but that will not bring your KML layers or custom content into that feature of the app at this time. Right. I've yeah. got another one here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Grant. Um, so we've got a question about adding labels to polygons. Um, is that possible to bring in a label uh, in ForeFlight? Uh, the way that we implement that is that you create your, your shape file or your polygon in Google Earth, and then you'll actually have to add an additional uh, waypoint wherever you want it placed on that, that shape file. So presumably in the middle, uh, and that's how you can add the label to the to the shape file or to the polygon. Otherwise, uh, we don't support the label uh, directly associated with the shape file. So here's another question sort of related to importing content packs. Um, this one is saying, could you just log into your ForeFlight account using your computer, then drop those files in via your ForeFlight account? And then when you open your iPad, uh, they'll be in ForeFlight. So the answer to that is, is no, there isn't any place on ForeFlight web where you can import these files. Um, the only way, if you wanted to import them from your computer, like I said, the easiest way to do that is to set up a linked Dropbox account, or, and, and this actually relates to another question, someone was wondering if we support cloud storage solutions other than Dropbox. We do, we support Box and Amazon S3. Um, so if you have one of those and you don't have Dropbox, then you can also use those. But uh, if you're trying to import uh, custom content from your computer without having your iPad right there, then Cloud Documents is, is by far the easiest way to do it. Next one, here's uh, an interesting question about a, a type of custom content that we haven't really touched on so far in this webinar. It says, we use .crd files containing search pattern routes uh, from the Coast Guard. Is this a standard file format, or is, or is there an easy way to change the extension if they're accidentally sent as a .txt? Can one of you speak to uh, how we support CRD files? I think that's going to need to go to Grant's wheelhouse. Oh. Um, so we do support the .crd file, uh, but it's not supported as part of a content pack layer. Uh, so we support direct importation of the CRD. Uh, so if that CRD file is being maybe emailed to you, you should be able to tap on it as a CRD and you'll get that prompt to, to open it in ForeFlight. Um, now, as for converting it from a text file to a CRD file, that, that's a bit outside my wheelhouse, but if you'd send us an email, uh, we'd be happy to help you troubleshoot that and see if there's any options to get that converted. Yeah, and that answer goes to any of the other questions that we haven't answered so far. Uh, there's a number of, of questions still outstanding here. Uh, we're not gonna be able to answer all of them, but um, please email team at fourflight.com with any questions you have about this stuff. Uh, because we, we can certainly answer any of your questions, but we can't necessarily answer all of them live right here and right now. <laughs> so uh, please do email in if you don't get your question answered or if you think of some other question uh, just after we finish this. So I, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Um, thank you so much everyone for joining. Uh, it's been great doing these webinars and seeing the reactions to them. I, I think people are really enjoying them and learning a lot about using ForeFlight from them. So we hope that you'll continue signing up, uh, registering for these and attending them. And uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you on the next webinar.